So hello and welcome to the second in a series of talks organised by the Law School at Birkbeck College. My name is Adam Geary, I'm a professor here in the Law School. Now it might strike you a little bit strange at first regard that a Law School is interested in archaeology, but I don't think it is so strange. In the first of the, uh, the, of the, the, the talks in this series, Dr. Carl Harrison uh, gave a presentation on forensic archaeology and clearly the techniques of forensic archaeology are incredibly important in producing evidence that can be heard in court. I suppose as well, if you think about it, law and archaeology are perhaps uh, brother disciplines. Both are concerned with the past, both are concerned with archiving, even if the archive of archaeology is the soil, whereas the archives of law are cases and I suppose paper based. Anyway, our subject for this evening is something quite new and quite strange, you might say. I'm very, very pleased to be able to introduce to you uh, Professor Henry Chapman from the University of Birmingham, Dr Benjamin Geary from the University of Cork, the Jagger and Richards of archaeology. Um, doctors, uh, Dr Geary and Professor Chapman will be talking about bog bodies. Now, bog bodies, I will give a very brief introduction, I am no expert, um, are the petrified human remains of uh, human beings found, well, in these specific circumstances. I guess as a lawyer, you might say, well, are these the remains of people who have suffered judicial execution? Perhaps they're not. Perhaps they are the bodies of people who have suffered some kind of ritual killing. For those who are reading a gamben, perhaps we may even in this experience with bog bodies come across the remains of Homo Saker. Um, as you can see from the screen, the uh, paper that you are about to hear has been described as one of the most disturbing that the referee in question has ever read. And so uh, with that in mind, I will hand over to Professor Chapman and Dr Geary. Thank you for that um, introduction. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're going to talk to you today about um, bog bodies. Um, bog bodies, I suppose, will be amongst the most uh, evocative of archaeological discoveries. And I imagine perhaps quite a few of you listening may indeed have been to exhibitions of bog bodies, for example, at the um, National Museum of Ireland in Dublin. Um, also the British Museum as well. Um, and again, these are extremely, um, I suppose, iconic finds um, that, uh, that I, I suppose literally, sounding like a cliche, bring the kind of the past into a really sharp focus. So what we're going to do today is we're going to um, present some work that I suppose is myself and Henry's uh, attempt to rethink, I suppose, aspects of the archaeological understanding of bog bodies. Bog bodies have been worked on for many years and there's been a huge amount of work carried out. So what we're, we're really describing here, is, I suppose, is, is ways of, of rethinking some of the themes that are around bog bodies. So rethinking the bog bodies of later prehistoric Europe. The, the comment is actually it's not from a referee, it was from a journalist who, um, after the paper that this is partly based on was published, um, sent myself and Henry an email saying um, he wanted to write about it and he said this, he said this is the most disturbing paper I've ever read, which at the time, and I'm still not sure whether that's a good or a bad thing. Anyway, um, you, you may be the judge. On that basis, we should present really, I suppose, um, uh, a trigger warning. So obviously this, this, this paper is going to contain images of human remains, uh, flesh human remains. So that's just a warning if you're, you're disturbed or distressed in any way by that, then this is probably this is probably not the talk for you. Um, so I would suggest you maybe switch off rather than look away because there's going to be quite a few bodies. Anyway, let's go. Let's get ourselves started. Henry. Yeah. So um, this is a bog body. Just to to we thought it's just before we actually get into the paper, um, we'll just say a few words about what a bog body is. And actually, at the broadest definition, it's just human remains from a bog. Um, so it's kind of what it says on the tin. Um, but the thing about these these remains is because of the conditions of the bog, the preservation of of the, the bits which normally rot away, the flesh, the internal organs, um, these things can be preserved. And, and I think you see it possibly in the best example here with Tolland Man found in Denmark in the 1950s. Um, and just the, the ability to look into somebody's face from somebody who's effectively over 2000 years old is just stunning. Um, and and I, I just really like the quote from the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, 
the dead and the sleeping, how they resemble one another. And I think you see that really clearly with, with Tolan Man. But the thing, thing with bulk bodies is that because of that preservation for archaeology, um, whereas we are normally dealing with uh, the remains of people which might be skeletal, um, as soon as you have bog bodies, you have so much more information. But of course, it's not just about the bog body. And as we'll see, it's about the environment which in which they're within. So it, we can find out so much. There's so much more information we can get from the individual about who they were, you know, what their, their lifestyle was in life, how they died, the trauma, um, but also about the environment where they're placed. So it's that our starting point is that increase of information which we can get. But of course, these are individuals which are found in bogs, which is not the way that normal burials would supposedly happen. So if we move on to the next slide, um, if we look at the way that these are normally interpreted, because they are unusual, the fact we're finding human remains in bogs, and for many periods, if we look at prehistory, the normal way people are buried, you know, there are normal practices, and those normal practices are not putting somebody into a bog. And the other thing is, you know, quite often they've got injuries. So what we're going to focus on is three main themes. And these three main themes for this talk, this gives us some structure, relate to the, the, the main trends in terms of interpretation. So the first of these trends is that most of them are later prehistoric. So quite often it's seen that bulk bodies are something which happen around the Iron Age, around about that, that, that sort of period. The, and, and this has been confirmed by dating of collections within museums. You know, a lot of the finds have ended up in museums. Um, the, second in, the second trend in interpretation is that they are brutally killed and quite often excessively killed, sometimes killed in multiple ways, you know, where one, one method would be enough. And the third one, which is really kind of what draws all these things together, is that they represent human sacrifice. So um, whilst there are other interpretations, um, that it might be about punishment, they might have been killed be as a punishment, or it might be a mugging or a murder or something accidental or so on. Um, the, pr the prevalent interpretation is about human sacrifice. So they're the three principal trends that we're going to be addressing. Ben. OK, so Henry's just explained, um, we have the number of themes we're going to look at here. In particular, as we've just seen, there's this general perception that bog bodies are what we call later prehistoric. So again, I suppose in, in Northwest Europe, the period we're talking about is approximately about from about three three thousand years uh, before present onwards. So about what we would refer to in archaeologists use use BCAD systems. So we're talking perhaps from about a thousand BC and sometimes a bit earlier. We do have earlier ones and um, through what we call kind of the end of the Bronze Age into the Iron Age. So that's that's our period. Um, to an extent, that date. Um, of later prehistory, we do, to be clear, we have bog bodies from those, and those are the bog bodies that tend to be the more famous ones that draw attention um, to them for that reason. So Tolan Man, we've just seen, he's a very famous bog body, later prehistoric. But we're going to think a bit more about date ranges and how that affects our interpretations. Second, violence, um, the way these people meet their ends. Um, and sometimes the killing of these people um, has been described as being very brutal. And we're going to return to think a little bit about what exactly that means and how an understanding of the last minutes of someone's existence might help us understand and interpret these finds. And that relates to number three, which is, I suppose, the purpose that Henry's alluded to already. Are these sacrificial um, events or are they punishments? Are they murders? Are they accidental? Or do they relate in some way to, um, I suppose, uh, normal burials, if that's the, the right the right word there? So that's what we're going to pull apart. So we're going to question one. Um, certainly, the bog bodies that draw the most attention are the ones that you can see here. These are the ones that are essentially flesh. They have flesh surviving on them. Um, and again, some of these you may be familiar with. Um, Graubal Man from Denmark, Lindo Man from England, Tollen Man we've just seen, Elling Woman. And again, most of these, in fact, all of these, I think, here are, are on display in different museums. So Lindo Man, for example, is in the British Museum. Clonny Cavan Man there is in the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin. And again, what you can see here is, is, is the broadly like, similar date range. So the few centuries uh, BC, so just over 2,000 years years old. 
um, and again, somewhere slightly later, Lindsay Mao, in particular, um, possibly Iron Age, possibly falls into the Romano British period. So, um, those are kind of, if you like, the typical kind of uh, kind of projection or idea of bog bodies. Henry. So the thing is, when you look at those examples, all of those have been found in the 20th century. And actually, most of those are found in the later part of the 20th century or early 21st century. They're all quite recent discoveries. And um, so, yeah, is there something unusual about those? Because the ones we know about are actually the ones which are found most recently. So. In a study looking at all of the bog bodies known from England, okay, so England is doesn't have a huge number. Yeah, we've only seen Lindo Man on that last slide. If you look at all the ones which were recorded, um, you find quite a lot. And actually, most of those bodies are, are only known that they're from the records. They don't exist anymore as physical physical bodies. They're actually sometimes referred to as paper bodies because they only exist on paper about what's written about them. But from the whole of, whole of England, Wales and Scotland, there's 180 bodies known. And of those, 87 have some indication of what date, what period they're from. And the graph here just shows that range. And probably immediately you'll see that for the post medieval period and Bronze Age is actually where the majority are. Most of them actually aren't from that you know, the end, end of prehistory, the Iron Age and Iron Age and Mono British. Um, yeah, there's a lot of more recent ones. Um, so actually, that that chronological range of bodies is not quite what the perception is um, that they're all sort of Iron Age or at least later prehistoric. So if we flip onto the next slide, if we start thinking about the date of discovery for these, this and how the archive is created effectively, um, some of the answers come up to this. And what, what what seems to be the driving factor in terms of what you what we know about is the, is the date when things are found. So if you think all of those examples, which we saw the photos of earlier, have been found in the 1900s or early 2000s. Um, but uh, and they're all relatively early. So this graph is showing basically the percentage of finds by century um, of different dates of bog bodies. So if you look at the prehistoric ones, prehistoric and Roman, that's the blue line here. There were none found in the 1600s. There are some found in the 1700s. But actually, the majority, as you see that blue line rising, most of those have been found in the 1900s. In contrast, if we go back to the 1600s, all of the bodies which were found were post-medieval or medieval, and actually that's dropped. Um, so actually, it seems to be that there's a relationship between what we're finding in museums and uh, and when they've been discovered. And this is significant because those it wasn't until around about the middle of the 20th century that we actually had the technology to conserve these remains. So actually, had you although bog bodies have been found before, um, they rotted away. You know, the actual the, the flesh parts they dried out, so, so they didn't look so good. They're not on display. Whereas the more recent discoveries are the ones which we naturally study. So if we flick onto the next slide, um, the rationale or the reason why this is happening is because of how they're discovered. So um, bog bodies, by definition, are found in bogs, um, and bogs grow sort of vertically through time. Um, so the top of a bog is more recent than the bottom of a bog. You know, that repeat is, is building up through time. So that means that um, if you start using a bog, so the, the, the historically some of the greatest practices and the reason why many of these bodies are found is because of peat cutting for fuel primarily, but for other, other purposes as well. You naturally start cutting peat from the top. So in the early years of cutting peat, say in the 1600s and 1700s, you're naturally going to be hitting anything which is preserved in those upper layers, so the post-medieval bodies. But as we've gone through time, through the centuries, and into the 20th century, we've gone deeper and deeper into the bog, or into the bogs generally, and now we're hitting prehistory. And so that correlation between the bodies which were being found at the same time when conservation methods were good enough to preserve these bodies happens to be hitting when we, when we hit prehistory. So there is this link between um, what's known as common perception of these bodies being later prehistoric and just merit of where they were found within the bog. Okay. Okay, so I suppose this is this is kind of illustrating um, what Henry's talking about about here, and that is the fact that that bogs um, have been heavily exploited through time um, for largely for fuel, particularly in countries such as Ireland, um, but elsewhere, the Netherlands, of course. 
drainage and reclamation related to really, I suppose, a perception um, that's changed very much in recent years that peatlands um, don't really fulfil any function um, for us um, in environmental terms. That's that's very much changed in recent years. We now know that, that peat bogs are extremely important for biodiversity, for hydrological storage and for um, and as, as carbon sinks. So bogs essentially are made up of, of plant remains. Plant remains are carbon. So functioning bogs act as carbon sinks. They store and lock up carbon. So hence in recent years, we've seen a shift towards um, the restoration and rehabilitation of bogs. Um, but the point that we, we're making here is the fact that as those processes of destruction of peat progress through time, that initially when peat was being cut by hand, as we see in these images here, um, that would uh, mean that the chances of discovery of archaeology such as bog bodies is very high because people were, were down at ground level, they were, they were cutting away. Um, as drainage and extraction shift in mechanical means, as per the bottom image you can see there, that's an image I think from an Irish bog, the chances of discovery are also much reduced because of that mechanical scale extraction, whereby really in more recent years we've relied on chance effectively for the discovery of bog bodies or very occasionally for um, for the eyes of, 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 of very um, observant archaeologists. So we have this kind of double whammy always with, with, with the archaeology of peatland systems is that the process of exposure is also the process of destruction and loss as well. And again, this is another reason why many of the bog bodies, if you consider the earlier slide, are often discovered partial. There are obviously parts of them missing because that, that, that's been cut away. So we don't really know how many bog bodies have actually been completely destroyed and lost by uh, mechanised peat extraction in more recent times. Henry. But, what, but, but the weird thing is that although that sort of demonstrates that most bog bodies are not laid prehistoric and it's a function of when they're found, but the odd thing is those bodies which are from that broad sort of end of prehistory, um, early Romano bridge period, they do stand out as a bit different. Um, they do tend to have the greater levels of injury. They do tend to have odd things happening to them. Um, so although they're not, you know, many other bog bodies relate to other periods. And actually, when you go into the detail, what you find is that many of the bodies from the post medieval period relate to things like people uh, just unfortunately trying to cross a bog and getting stuck and drowning. Those sorts of activities when you see the historic record. But those which are from the period which is you know, classically related to bog bodies, this Iron Age particularly, that's broad period, um, there is something weird going on. We do tend to have other sorts of things we, which are distinctive. Which brings us on to the second question. The second question, which is about violence and what's actually happening, because these bodies seem to have more of that evidence. Uh, let's have the next one. So question two was you know, about violence. Is it all about brutality? And I think if we just look at this picture on the left, um, and it is so disturbing that actually when you look at it for the first time, it takes a moment to work out what you're looking at. So this is an individual who's decapitated. He's also cut in half. Um, and what you can't see quite so well, unless you, you look in detail, is also he had holes cut through his biceps where withies were passed, possibly to hang him up, you know, to actually hang up that part of the body or all of him. And the other thing which you can't see quite there is he had his nipples cut off. So if we want to think about brutality, um, he's not unique. Yeah, you know, there's there's a high level of likely brutality, and this this sort of evidence has been um, has led people to look at the historic literature, yeah, you know, particularly early medieval literature, but also going back into classical literature to try and find answers for why this might be. And part of it relates to, um, I mean, very influentially, Lucan, who, who as an individual died very young, but he's living in the first century AD. Um, and he, he, he had uh, this particular reference, which is uh, translated here, um, related to three different gods of the people of the time. Um, who And, and uh, within the 10th century marginalia, this is also um, related to different ways in which each of those gods, you know, how you'd sacrifice for each god. So one god, you might sacrifice an animal or, or, or a human using hanging. You might sacrifice to another god using fire or maybe a weapon to stab them, and another god to in relation to drowning. So, um, and also, you know, whilst there's grey areas within that, this idea of uh, having multi different sorts of ways of sacrificing different gods is, is something which has really sort of stayed within 
the sort of perception of bog bodies. But mo even more so, because many of the bodies have multiple injuries, the idea of, of multiple deaths, effectively, which, which link us to early medieval literature, um, things like the death of Dermot, where um, a king, is, is his future is foretold that he will die in three ways. He will drown, he will be stabbed, and he will burn. Um, and actually, as the story plays out, those things do happen. In, in, a, in a single event. So this idea of threefold death as, as almost sort of a, a very symbolic exercise has been used to interpret bog bodies. So should we move on to the next one? And this is well illustrated, this sort of interpretation with the example of Lindo Man. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at Lindo Man um, in a bit of detail. Then we're going to look at some of the other injuries which bog bodies have. Um, ben, do you want to talk about Lindo? Yeah, I suppose Lindo Man would be one of the kind of um... Kind of again, a, a kind of certainly entered the popular consciousness in the 1980s when the the body was discovered on Lindo Moss, which is in a, a peat bog in in Cheshire in England, in northern England. Um, and again, this is a, a peat bog that was being extracted for peat, which is again is how this body was found. Um, um, again, there's many kind of tales one could tell about this, not least the fact he picked up um, a, a, a humorous <laughs> nickname, um, Pete Marsh. Um, he became known as, um, and um, again, there's there's a, there's a there's a kind of a whole kind of, I suppose, a story to be told about that kind of discovery and the media reporting of that and um, everything that followed. But for our purposes, um, he's significant for a number of reasons. One of which is for the evidence on the on on his body of for um, his cause of the cause of death. So again, this is an advantage that we have of bog bodies as obviously you're gathering invariably with archaeological remains in the form of skeletons. We often do not have direct evidence of, of, of how people died unless that's very clearly registered in skeletal remains. But where we have soft tissue, we can we can often extract those clues. And Lindo Man is is a, a very kind of good example of this claimed motif of the triple death. Um, he's also um, kind of well known for, you can see bottom left on the screen there, a facial uh, reconstruction. And that was carried out by the um, by a gentleman called uh, Richard Neve, he's based actually in Manchester, and he became very well known for these kind of facial reconstructions. Previously, he worked on um, forensically on, on murder cases where only skeletal remains um, survived, and he would, based on anatomical principles, uh, would create these uh, reconstructions of people's faces and apparently with uncanny accuracy for in some in some cases. So again, this is another thing about bog bodies is, is our ability to kind of produce these kind of faces, faces from the past. Anyway, I digress. So Linda Mann is important because of the evidence for the way in which he met his end. And um, and this is this evidence allows us to reconstruct the sequence of events that lead up to Lindo Man ending up as he does in a, a pool on a peat bog. Um, it seems that he, he was kneeling down. He was potentially made to kneel down again, which obviously brings into questions of how many other people were there that may have been involved in the killing. We'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, he, he's on his knees. Um, he had a garrote around his neck. Um, the suggestion is perhaps he was in some way being held up. Uh, by the garage. Then in some in some detail, and this is fairly gruesome, we can reconstruct what happened next. So his throat was cut. There's evidence for his throat being slit quite deeply. Um, that seems to have been accompanied by the tightening of the garrote round his neck. What that would have led to would have been essentially a, a, a blood spurt or a shower of blood, which in itself is a fairly alarming thought. Um, he then, he then he suffered two Blows probably in quick succession to the top of his head, possibly with an axe, some form of blunt instrument. Um, the forensic examination that was carried out on his remains suggests that, that, that those blows would probably not have killed him, would have but would have knocked him out. Um, and again, this recent re-examination of, of the body suggests that was it an axe or was it something else? Um, I suppose in a sense that's that's academic in terms of our uh, our interests here. Um, and he was then. The, his body, his unconscious body, or at that point probably dying or dead body, was pushed forward into a pool on the bog surface. So again, we have this very kind of precise um, series of, of um, events or the, the kind of sequence of events that kind of led to the end of this individual's life. Henry. Yeah, 
So partially because the, the, the detailed examination of examples of Lindo Man, um, uh, and actually dating from even before that, from sort of 1960s sort of interpretations, people have seen bog bodies and they've seen this evidence of that increased evidence because of the flesh and the body that you can see so much. And they've identified loads and loads of injuries on them. So if we go through a few, um, the, the, here's, here's Boromos 3. Now, with archaeology, we have this great convention where we, we, you might notice that Lindo Man is also known as Lindo 2, you know, because there was a Lindo 1. And Boromos 3 is the third of a group. Um, but she was found in, in the bog and she had, she had been sculpted. You know, her hair was, you know, the top of her head was moved away from, from the, the skull. Also, her face had been smashed in. You know, the actual the, the the front of the skull had been destroyed, and she had a broken leg. But the problem is actually when these the body was re-examined, it turned out actually all of this was taphonomic, which means that basically this was to do with the burial environment. None of these injuries were real. The scalping and the and the bro and the smashed skull was all because of the weight of the peat. So as the peat's growing up above the body. It's forcing that waste, and that's what smashed the skull. It also forced the skull away from the skull. So that idea of scalping. It also broke her leg. And actually, when we look at this individual, there's no obvious cause of death. There's certainly no violence. So this starts making things quite curious because as soon as whilst Lindo Man, we know there are injuries, we can see them, we we can demonstrate it. With some of the other examples, it's not so clear. So let's look, have a look at another one. So here's, here's a second one. This is Vindaby 1. It's actually one of a pair of bodies. Um, now, this is found in northern Germany. It was uh, it was a girl. Um, she had half her head shaved off, which is significant because although we only have very few contemporary sources from, from Roman writers, um, what we know is that for crimes, as they're put, such as adultery, um, women would have their heads shaved. So this is clearly something which is which is relevant. Um, she is blindfolded. You can see the blindfold in the in one of the pictures here, and her hand was arranged in an obscene hand gesture. And on top of that, a year later, five meters away, a second body was found, Vindaby two. It was a man, and he had been strangled with a hazel sort of rope. So clearly, these were lovers. They were both killed for adultery. And that interpretation stayed for a long time, but it turned out that actually, firstly, radiocarbon dating, so dating of the bodies, showed that there was at least 100 years between the two. They could never have lived at the same time. Secondly, um, further examination of the body of a Vindaby girl turned out it was actually, she was male. It was, it was actually Vindaby boy, probably a little bit older, probably about 17. Um, the half shaven head was actually because of the preservation is because that was the upper side of the body and that part had, had decayed. It wasn't shaven at all. And the blindfold was actually a hairband which had slipped. And the obscene hand gesture, it turned out from looking at records, was actually an, uh, one of the curators in the museum had rearranged it to make it fit other models. So suddenly we've got a completely different interpretation. And when we look in detail, what, what did kill Vinby Boy, as it is, or man? Um, Probably a tooth abscess. There's no other evidence. It's probably something entirely natural. Should we have the next one? Do you want to do this one, Ben? Uh, no, please carry on. Carry on. So, I mean, this is continuing the same sort of story. This is Gravel Man, um, who, again, within the sort of received wisdom, you probably understand where this is going now. He had a fractured skull, a slit throat. His slit throat was so deep, it cut through his trachea, you know, the windpipe, which meant he... He couldn't have well. He couldn't have made a noise when he's screaming. Um, he also had a broken leg. So the the received interpretation was they broke his leg so he couldn't escape, and they hit him on the head and slit his throat. But actually, again, these taphonomic factors. Certainly, the fractured skull is not real. That's something to do with the weight of the peat. The slit throat is real. The jury's out, so to speak, on, in terms of the broken leg. We're not too sure whether that happened before or after he died. But still, the injuries go from many to very few. The next one leads to a bit of a question, actually. As we start re-examining the bodies, or other people have been re-examining re the bodies, we start reducing the number of injuries, but this means now we can be accurate. What's really happening? So ben, do you want to go through these? So yeah, so we have some 
themes that start to emerge here, and that is um, the role of hanging and strangulation and injuries to the neck, as we've seen already, and many of these are are certainly um, certainly uh, real, if you like. These are, these are not related to some of the processes that Henry was talking about, and that's, I suppose, relatively obvious with Tolan Mann, who had a noose around his neck. We've also mentioned already, um, of course, Lindo Mann with a garrote around his neck and other examples of throat cutting and throat slitting. Um, so we seem to have these emerging patterns. And again, if we look at the broadly at the dates of these um, of these bodies, which bring us into the um, into the Iron Age, um, and occasion to the Romano-British period, we start to observe certain trends for certain bodies. So we're able to kind of start to, I suppose, in a, in a legal or a forensic manner, start to pick our way through these injuries and start to identify patterns that are real, um, that are perimortem as opposed to post-mortem injuries. So this allows us to start to think in, I suppose, a more informed way or a more closely informed way about, um, about the final moments of these individuals. And from an archaeological point of view, it allows us to think about what that tells us about how people are dying or how the sequence of events we've seen already. So again, we have cranial trauma. We've, we've talked about that. We've talked about the evidence for uh, Lindo Mann being um, struck with a blunt instrument, possibly an axe. And um, we also see that with um, with Connie Cavan Mann, as we've mentioned previously as well. So again, we start to kind of close in, I suppose, on on patterns um, within our within our data sets. And again, that allows us to think um, about what this what this means. Again, uh, throat slitting we've talked about already, or throat slitting and garrotting. At Graubal Mann, though, Henry just talked about Lindo Mann, we've mentioned as well. So we might start to think, what, what is the significance of this? Now, again, from, from a point of view of, I suppose, a, a cynic might say, well, if you're going to kill someone, if you want to finish someone off, cutting their throat is a pretty good way to do it. But that still leaves us with certain questions, and not least that returns, I suppose, as some, of the, some of the issues referred to earlier, particularly about uh, theories of what we sometimes call overkill. So the idea that some of these people uh, may have been killed in inverted commas more than once. Um, obviously, <laughs> the removal of the head is is a very surefire way to um, to finish someone off for obvious reasons. And um, we've we've seen examples of that with Old Crown Man, who seems to have had his uh, his head removed completely. Um, um, we have Oster Osterby man there as well. Incidentally, there's an interesting point about some of these bog bodies you can see there. We occasionally have the, the hair survives intact and there's actually quite a lot of discussion about that because this is really just about, at least in terms of Northwest Europe, uh, really one of the few archaeological examples we have of what people's hairstyles were like in the past. Um, and again, there's a whole kind of um, another, maybe another paper and discussion about, about that in itself. Um, we also have evidence for other rather unpleasant injuries such as the Dark Gun 2 man from Germany who appears to have been um, have been emasculated. Um, so yes, this is all getting very gruesome uh, again um, and it's a rabbit hole you can disappear down quite quickly. Uh, Henry, then, if you want to pick up on the gruesomeness there. Yeah, I mean, as, as we keep on going through the injuries into the certain ones, stabbing and disemboweling is another one. Um, with the Verdinger men from the Netherlands, one of them at least was, was disemboweled. Um, they, intestines were pulled out through the cup and the stomach um and possibly that uh, to my mind one of the saddest bog bodies k house and boy who um who was tied up as you can sort of see in this reconstruction here um he was six and a half years old and he was stabbed three times in the neck and just the when we consider the brutality of people in the past yeah i, it, I don't think you can get quite as more or at least any more striking than that one so moving on So this leaves us with a number of conclusions. The first of those is actually there's fewer injuries on these bodies than we previously thought. If you think of Boromos 3 with a face smashed in, which wasn't, and other things. So we, 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 we can narrow down those injuries. That does raise questions about what does it mean? And what, one of the things that we, we were considering with this was, well, you know, what actually happens to somebody in those final moments? Um, how much... I mean, it might seem a bit perverse, but how much suffering, in a relative sense, do people suffer um, with each of these injuries? Yeah, and whilst it's impossible to 
have that level of, sort of physical empathy, um, we can measure consciousness. How long is it until people lose consciousness? So, um, and the ways of trying to find this out takes you down into all sorts of routes to f from other sorts of disciplines, other sorts of literature. So looking at just those four we've just been talking about, cranial trauma, um, there's a huge medical literature on that because it's something which yeah, medics have to deal with all the time. You've got open, open head injury, you know, some, if it's um, impacting on the brain, immediate loss of consciousness. And that's, you know, that, that's quite clear. Hanging and strangulation is very difficult to get literature on. And actually, um, the, the, there are very, very few studies on this. There, there are some historical anecdotes from hangmen, um, those sorts of events, which are largely unreliable. Um, and actually, the, the literature comes from some very, very uh, tragic events where people have filmed suicides. And so there's very, very few examples. But what we do know is if, if the spinal cord is broken, immediate loss of consciousness, from asphyxia, you'll die in a couple of minutes but actually you lose consciousness from cutting off the blood to the brain um, uh, in roughly 15 seconds. And as we keep on going through these, uh, yeah, obviously having the decapitation is kind of reasonably immediate as far as we understand. Slitting your throat, if you're losing, if you're cutting off the blood to the brain, you might, it might be four seconds before you lose consciousness. And equally stabbing, okay, it depends on where you're being stabbed. But if you're actually hitting the heart, which most of these examples seem to, then you're looking at something like four seconds for loss of consciousness. So what this is showing actually across those four areas of injuries, which we can demonstrate, the actual um, loss of consciousness is quite rapid. And actually, if you think about that as, as a proxy for suffering, um, that becomes very interesting. So. so yeah, so again, this might seem all very morbid, and I, 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 suppose, I suppose it is, but again, this is, um, if we want to understand and interpret these um, later prehistoric bomb bodies in particular, this is important for us as archaeologists. Indeed, in the same, I suppose, in a legal framework, understanding um, death and the particular nature of perimortem and postmortem injury. But what is extremely interesting is once we start to pull this together in terms of the injuries, and that is the injuries that we are fairly certain are real injuries and did not happen as a result of the body being buried for thousands of years in, in peat, this is kind of what you see. And again, you know, you can browse through this table. What it starts to tell us is that most of the time where we can perform this kind of analysis, we, we're seeing these people um, who are meeting these grisly ends, and to be sure the ends are grisly, just to be very clear on that. But um, these people are probably losing consciousness very rapidly. So again, why that's important is because discussions um, or framings of these killings as somehow as being torture. Well, again, that depends on how you define torture. But this is not torturous in the sense that these killings seem to be being strung out unnecessarily. Now, also to be clear, this doesn't count for the psychological aspects of this, nor indeed for, the, for, for any of the um, considerations as to whether these people knew what was going to happen to them in advance and so forth. That's a slightly different discussion. But what we do see is the fact that, as this table demonstrates, some of these individuals were probably losing consciousness and and or or dying really quite quickly so and as you can see this is a relatively small sample of, of, of what we have and as henry observed earlier by the time we've gone through the archive and removed cases where we don't have the information or reanalyses that tell us that the uh, previous injuries were probably um not perimortem um, we end up with a relatively small sample, but nevertheless, if you look at this table, I think it's, it's, it's relatively compelling. But how does this relate then to interpretation? So how can we use this to think about the broader, I suppose, kind of um, the moments around the end of these, these people's lives and how that might relate to the perpetrators of these killings? Um, and again, just to open this up a bit, and I suppose this also relates to um, uh, forensic investigation, because we've talked a lot about the bodies. Clearly, these are key in our understanding, but we need to understand broadly where these bodies are found. Now, of course, the answer to that is box. Um, but in the past, there's been a tendency to not quite ignore, but to kind of um, kind of skate over the fine spots and assume that all bogs are the same, all bogs are wet, all bogs are peat forming environments and so forth. But actually, bogs vary as landscapes. They change through time, 
and they vary spatially. So uh, particularly some obvious points about, about this might be that bogs expand and grow across the landscape. So the extent of a bog in the present day is not the extent of the bog in the past. Other things, bogs are wet, they are certainly wet, but they vary in their surface wetness. They change the wetness through time and that can vary from uh, periods where you might have open water, pools on a bog, through to drier environments. That also relates to the kind of plants that grow and form the peat, vegeta the peat forming vegetation. So all of these aspects are important in terms of what we call as archaeologists the context of discovery. So to understand the bog body or the, 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 that event, the killing or the end of the life of that person, we need to situate and place that event within the context of the landscape that we find that within. An added complication here, of course, is that in the past, um, particularly in prehistory and possibly earlier, um, people, communities were also exploiting peatlands. They were cutting peat. And that also relates to the discovery of certain bog bodies and the fact that they, some bog bodies seem to have been placed in peat cuttings that were open at the time of their, um, the end of their life. Henry. So if we're trying to think about the actual the, the context of the body or the, or the find of the body as a way of trying to understand the event, I mean, I, you, know, I, I, you, you can think about it as almost as the scene of crime, if you like, or, or you can use similar sorts of ways of thinking about that moment. Because actually, you know, if you think that actually the, the victim is only one part of it, thinking about the, the, the scene is, is clearly important. And some specific questions come up because, uh, as Ben said, a bog changes in its shape, it expands through time. So at a particular time, such as when the body was placed in the bog or killed on the bog, um, how far was that from the actual edge? Because the edges have moved. So, you know, was it near the edge or was it right in the middle? Which is a question about accessibility. So how easy was it? But the, the second question comes down to how hard was it to actually get across that bog? So, OK, it might be, yeah, it might, you, you might have a body which is right in the middle of a bog at the time. But if that bog is quite dry and easy to walk on, that's not too big a deal. Whereas if that bog is actually very, very wet, yeah, you know, it's at a time when it's it's because of climate or something else, it's become wetter, then actually that can become really treacherous. Um, I've always always think of things like you know, Conan Doyle's Hound of the Baskervilles and the idea of being sort of swallowed up by the bog, because we know this has happened. So the the risk of carrying a dead body across a wet bog or or having somebody walk to their death, these things become important and clearly are important to interpretation. If it's a mugging and a murder, asking somebody to then walk to the middle of a bog is unlikely. So we, we can start using the scene to help us. Yeah. You know, second, a third point is, you know, if you know, taking it down the ritual or the the the, the, the um, human sacrifice line, why might they be sacrificing people? Is it because of loss of crop? Is it because the weather's got worse? It, how have things been getting wetter over time? Can we help that? Yeah. You know, is it a response to change? And fourthly, out of this list is how visible was the event yeah if yeah how open was the landscape could you have had an audience is it a ceremonial event where people could watch it or is it something which is closed and hidden like a murder next one so to address that you can start looking at the environment there's all sorts of methods where we can look at the peat itself because the peat because in the same way as the body doesn't decay so much uh, so does the environment. So all the plants, you know, the, the, the microscopic plants and also the, the, the visible plants, they're still there. So we can use those to reconstruct the environment and the animals within that, that, that environment to, to understand what it was like at the time when these bodies were deposited. And equally, we can start mapping where the edges of the peatland were at those same times. Ben, did you want to add anything to that? Um. No, I suppose just to expand on that, really, I, again, it comes back to understanding context and the importance of, of peat bogs, as Henry has said, is the fact that we have this preservation, which leads to the bodies being preserved in the first place. And that is due to the um, the oxygen, the saturated oxygen free conditions of peat bogs, at least before they're drained. So, of course, that's the other point that we should, probably should mention is when we see these pictures of peat bogs in the present day, such as the one here with um, Henry's colleagues working on the surface of a bog, this is a very dry bog now because it's been drained and cut. So again, this is another problem with understanding these landscapes. As an archaeologist, the important thing is to walk into a landscape and be able to kind of understand that landscape. But with peat bogs, 
you can't do that by kind of standing there because they've changed through time, they've been cut, they've been drained. So in terms of their appearance in the past, that, that's very different. And that's where this approach becomes significant in terms of perhaps analysing the peat, understanding sequences of environmental change as might be reflected by pollen grains preserved in the peat, for example, and what that tells us about vegetation change and about the landscape around the bog and how that's changed through time. So that's another important aspect of understanding that context. And this comes on to some work that um, uh, that, that Henry began some uh, years ago now. Again, this is the site of Lindo Moss in Cheshire, um, where, of course, we've heard of the discovery of Lindo, the Lindo Man. There are other bog body finds from here as well. Um, so if we want to understand that landscape context, we have potential as well as problems. The, problems is, the problem is a lot of the peat has been cut away. So if we go back to these sites to reanalyse, we often find that the deposits that we're interested in have been removed, as we saw earlier in the talk. So what can we do? Well, we, sometimes we can analyse the deposits that remain. Something else we can do, and this is what this image shows, is we can start to reconstruct the landscape that lies below the bog. So the peatland grows in a landscape that's previously dry land. Now, this is what these images are showing, showing you here. Um, and this is we, how do we do this? Very simply by taking cores, recording the depth of those cores, and obviously being able to kind of position those cores um, spatially very accurately. And that is what this... Uh, model shows us here. So this is a model of the contours of the basin that Lindo bog grew within. Henry. Yeah, and I, I, the, by modelling that, then you can use other lines, other areas of data to simulate the ele you know, where the where the surface of the peat was. So you can sort of grow it through time in in many ways. Um, but really, the conclusion from that is shown both in the two bottom pictures, here, which show you the locations of the body finds in relation to the extent of peatland round about the same time, or the light years modelled extent of peatland, at the same time when these bodies were deposited um, in relation to the dry land. So the, the, the wetland or the bog is, is in brown here and you see the contours behind it. What we also know, which isn't clear from the pictures, is that at the time when Lindo Man was deposited, the environment was getting wetter and it had been for some time before that. So it's a harder landscape to walk on and if you look at particularly at the, uh, you can see with the arrow there, the bottom dot, where Lindo Man was placed was pretty much as far from dry land as it's possible to get. And the other finds of bits of bog bodies were also quite far from dry land. So if, if we just think about that model in terms of if you if you're if you're murdering somebody and trying to hide the body quickly, you're unlikely to drag them out to the middle of a bog, which is largely you know free of trees, but quite visible and hard to get to and dangerous to get to. Um, you, you're more likely to, lead, you know, to, to hide them in the bushes on the edge, maybe. Um, this seems to tell a very, very different story. So we start looking, it starts opening up the idea that this was a highly visible, visible event. But it was also a very deliberate event in terms of where, the, where he was placed in the middle of the bog. It's something which tends to veer towards that, almost supporting that human sacrifice argument, which we'll come back to. Next one. And the thing is with Lindo, it's it's not on its own. We, but we're looking at other examples. So we, we saw Tolomand and Elling Woman earlier on. They're from a very different sort of bog. It's it's a it's a valley, peatfield valley. Um, there's actually three bog bodies from from that area. Um, a lot of the peat's been removed. But if we go on to the next slide, from modelling the peat again, it's the same process of of boreholes and um, you know coring and analysis of that. What we find is the actual body is pretty central in the bog. There's been a lot of work in terms of going through archives and finding out exactly what's real, what's not. But it, it turns out the bodies are reasonably central in that bog. Um, and at a point when it's when, well, we, we don't know whether the environment's getting wetter at the time. You know, the, most of the peat's gone, that takes more analysis. But this similar pattern, not being on the edge of the bog, but being in the middle. This particularly raises questions, because if you remember, um, Tolan Man was hanged. So what was he hanged from? Yeah, this sort of bog surface, if it's very wet, is unlikely to support trees. So it raises these questions about those minutes around his death. Next one. And a similar, well, sort of similar approach for Boromos 1. So we, we saw Boromos 3, you can see the picture here, of three bog bodies um, within a, a, a large bog in, in Jutland, northern Denmark. Um, three bog bodies being placed into that bog. 
Um, looking at the, the, the profile across the bog at the top shows that Boromos 1, which is the only one which actually has signs of deliberate killing, he's been hanged again. It's on the picture, you can probably just see the noose around his neck. Um, his place, not in the middle of the bog, but well beyond the edge of what would have been woodland at the time, probably. Um, his place, in, once the bog becomes more open and treeless, so that's kind of the environment his place is. In contrast, the other two bog bodies, although the, the detailed analysis hasn't happened yet, but they're much closer to the edge of the bog. And actually, those bodies, were, they're more likely to be sort of normal burials. So it seems to be something of a pattern emerging. If you just look at Lindo Man, we look at um, the examples from Bielskadel, which is the Tollen Man, Elling Woman, and you look at Boromos One, this pattern of being in quite difficult to get to places for deliberate killings. Next one. Ben, do you want to tell us? So, yeah, sure. So, um, so this is an attempt to kind of start to pull this thing together a little bit to try and pull out patterns, I suppose, in terms of we've talked about patterns of, of death and perimortem injuries. Um, and what, what we're trying to do here is try and pull out patterns in terms of the location of where these bodies were deposited. So as Henry's observed already, we can start to potentially see some patterns that we can start to interpret. And again, this is always problematic with anything with archaeology. We have to make certain assumptions all the way through. But nevertheless, we do get some patterns that are, do seem to emerge, and particularly the fact that some of these bog bodies evidently were, de were deposited in areas that were fairly, fairly open. They were fairly central in terms of the wetland system. So again, these are not, these are not bodies that are being deposited in or hidden, if you like, in places that would have kind of been an obvious place to hide the body or indeed if you were going to deposit a body in a bog you might throw it in the water at the edge or you might kind of dig a hole and put it in at the edge you probably wouldn't drag the body out into the middle of the bog or as henry said indeed if the person is being killed on the bog make the march all the way out there unless that was important unless it's a significant part of how we understand and interpret these uh, bog bodies in terms of the social and cultural context of why people in later prehistory or why these certain people seem to be meeting the ends that they are. So again, this is this is again this is an attempt to to start to pull together these patterns where the information um, exists. And again, you can again this is obviously a detailed table. We don't need to go through it in too much detail, but this is just really a demonstration of of how we kind of proceed through this and also the gaps in the data. So, for example, if we look to the right hand side there, we've talked about accessibility um, we, and where, where we're able to kind of make a conclusion about that and um, that appears in green. Other cases we, we don't know, we don't have the information, we might be able to go back and find out. Um, but you can see some very clear patterns. So, for example, it, often with, with burials um, in prehistory, people were buried with things, with funerary goods. Quite often that's not the case with bog bodies, as you can see there. So you can start to pull these pit patterns together. And again, there's other uh, aspects we might, we've, we've mentioned here in terms of what we might call uh, distinctive features of these individuals. Henry, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. We've, we've mentioned already, for example, you know, hairstyles, Osterby Man had a very distinctive haircut called the Swabian Knot. Um, and again, other, other bog bodies such as either girls seem to have suffered from physical conditions such as scoliosis, that's curvature of the spine. The spine. Henry, I don't know if you want to pick up on any of that at all. Yeah, I, I, one, of the, one of the challenges with looking at, at um, any set of data is how many, yeah, the more, almost the more categories you can get in terms of analysis, the greater the resolution, the detail, but also the greater the complexity. So, so that's sort of the challenge we we we, we fit in. So, the the things we've been talking about today in terms of um, the the nature of injuries and the deliberate nature of killing, we've we've talked about the the scene of crime, if you like, we've talked about some other things. But but there are there are many other aspects. In many of the bog bodies had no clothes on, but some of them did. Um, so that's another category category we could bring in. The distinctive individual part is a really difficult one. I think is is the best, and 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 Ben and I have talked about this at length because many of the bog body examples have something which is distinctive physically about their bodies. Yeah, because we can only measure physical; we can't measure, we can't see beyond that. 
Um, but what we don't have is a sample of all people to know whether how distinctive these things were. Um, so the, the, the problem with much of this is we might just be seeing the exceptional and therefore seeing it as exceptional rather than, you know, it becomes very, very difficult to actually give any real sense of what makes somebody distinctive. Um, uh, in many ways, we could have headed that uh, particular column notes might have been a more more realistic way of, of doing it. But this is this is the sort of way which you try and construct patterns, because actually trying to understand a fragmentary record, a fragmentary archive, um, we will never have all the parts. So what we have to do is then look at as many different categories as we can and then start finding patterns within them. And this sort of diagram is kind of one of those starting points for that kind of work. But I think what, what I would say is the areas which stand out as very red start looking much more like normal burials. And you know, we, we talked earlier about Boromos 3 and Vindaby 1. They look very much like normal burials. That's you know, normal practice. Whereas as they become green, maybe we're down in the world of human sacrifice, which is kind of the start of this final third question. So, so, we, oh, sorry, so sorry, no, sorry. Um, so I suppose, you know, as we try and pull this together, we've kind of been, I suppose, on, on various uh, avenues here. Um, but to return to the start, what is it we know now that we didn't know before? What nuances have we been able to identify? And I suppose beginning from the top down, we've seen already that, that many of the bog bodies um, are not later prehistoric. Um, it's the later prehistoric ones that are distinctive, and that is, for many, that is, this really explains why quite often these these individuals draw a large amount of archaeological and indeed, for that matter, public attention. So that's understandable, and, and that's that we can say with some confidence. Um, clearly, these people are dying in violent ways, um, but we've suggested here, and again, this is something that that one can debate and discuss, and there are problems with this. We've suggested to an extent that the suffering of these individuals. Um, often seems to have been minimised, that is, they, their violent ends don't seem to have been strung out unnecessarily. Again, and if we bring the think of this in a legal sense and we think about the crime scene, we can maybe start to link that in terms of what we might describe as different motives, in particular the choices that were being made for the places where these people were deposited, the places indeed where they may have met their deaths. And again, we've been able to pull out some patterns and some some um, some contrasts within that as well. And um, I think also important there is the fact that when we think about bogs and peatlands, we need to um, think about these uh, different aspects of bogs in terms of accessibility, uh, movement, and, and visibility. So, could these uh, events, if people are being killed out in a bog, that that would be highly visible, and that's important. That's how we that's how we interpret. So that leads us now to the fact that we can start to think about these ideas of comparison of sacrifice, so perhaps unusual deaths compared with what we might call more normal burial practices. And there's different ways we can think about sacrifice as well. Um, and that is really a theme for a completely different talk. And I think importantly here as well is the fact we can now know where to target more work because these finds, and I think this is important, is that they're actually very rare in terms of other archaeological finds from peat box. We have much archaeology from peat box. Bog bodies, for many of the reasons we've talked about, tend to draw most attention. Henry. So, yeah, so in terms of just finally, finally I mean, it's, it's up until recently, um, people have always looked at bog bodies, people have been fascinated by them. The visceralness, I think, is, is, a, is a huge factor. But actually trying to break the impasse where we can actually get into that sort of detail. Hopefully today you've sort of seen some of the ways which you might go thinking about that. But I think at the heart of it, and this goes right back to the start of this, this talk um, when, as, when Adam was, was introducing us, that it's about that mixture of disciplines. Actually, most of the advances, I think, within bog body studies in, in recent years have happened as a result of conversations with people who specialise in something else. I think that's really important that people talk across you know, different ways of thinking about something. And just finally, if we go to the final slide, I just thought this was quite telling. Now, we've just spent the last however long talking about bog bodies. Um, and it reminds me of this. This was actually tweeted by a, a, a colleague of ours. So I actually saw it on, on, the, on, on the 
on Twitter. Um, so it's a picture of Ben, um, but, but the actual caption in a room full of non archaeologists. Um, we suddenly realised that liking ball bodies is really quite freakish, and we shall leave you with that. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm not sure if we've got time for questions. I've had hundreds of questions, but one thing that just as you, one thing I would really like to just pull out and uh, ask you about is um, the idea of overkilling that you were talking about, because as a non-specialist, uh, there's clearly, well, not clearly, but what the suggestion seems to be there, that there is some symbolic aspect. Uh, why would you kill anybody more than more than once? It, it made me think of some of the things that the uh, French writer, philosopher Georges Bataille uh, says, but I'm sure that's not perhaps the time to pick up on some of these. But I, I'm just wondering if you had any kind of last reflections on that idea the the evidence seems to suggest that killing has moved beyond the functional to, to something that seems to have at least to our eyes my eyes a sim symbolic elements which we we can't we can't can reconstruct belief systems but did, is that do you think that's important within the evidence um it does seem to be central to your analysis i'm just wondering if you had any final uh, comments on that particular theme um, sorry, I, so I'll just say something. For, yeah, I mean, I think um, I think the answer to that is is yes. I, and I guess in terms of what we talked about today, I suppose, Henry, it's not something we've um, you may have done yourself, Henry. It's not something we've, re we've returned to talk about, think about rather in in a, in a more uh, I suppose uh, theoretical framework, if if you like, of what this means. So I suppose this step has been establishing, as we said earlier on, exactly what patterns we see are. Are, are real. So exactly which injuries are real, which ones were, were post-mortem. And there's still actually some debate about that. So Connie Cabin Man, if you remember, who was missing his sadly missing his head and his lower half. Um, there's been some discussion as to whether, for example, uh, Henry referred to his nipples being removed. There's been some discussion as to whether that's a real injury or whether that's somehow uh, post-mortem. But the important point to note um, there is that, and it's something we didn't touch on, is one of the interpretations of Irish Bog bodies, in particular later prehistoric ones, stress it or suggest that these individuals were failed kings, kings in inverted commas. Um, and there's a variety of reasons around that, one of which they relates to the removal of the nipples. So in, in medieval Ireland, the suckling of the nipples was, um, was a, a sign of fealty to a king. So obviously, if you had your nipples removed, then you could not be a king. So this ties into these, I suppose, I suppose I'm answering your question in a roundabout way that is. Is we need to move, I think, move on to now to think about these injuries that, that are definitely perimortem and how we understand them. But certainly, I think the most of the triple killing is in there. But um, yeah, I don't know, Henry. I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I, I, I think. I mean, there's, there's, there's other things that you could add in. I mean, the problem is with archaeology, we only see the physical evidence. There's some evidence. Okay, it's not very good evidence at the moment, but yours is very scant in terms of drugs as well. Drug use with with bog bodies, at least two of them possibly. Um, we don't know if they're poisoned. You know, there might be other other deaths which we're not seeing. But equally, we're, from the evidence we have, isn't it curious that some of them are killed in multiple ways and some of them are killed in just one way? Yeah. So, so sometimes it doesn't happen. But the one thing which really, you know, it's it's tradition. It's always been likened this triple death has been likened to the early medieval kind of historical the, the sort of mythology around that. But one thing which I, I like to relate it to is is a site um, in Norfolk in England. The um, of uh, Sea Henge. And the reason I raise this is it, it, it was a prehistoric site, but the analysis of the axe marks, the marks left on the wood from people, you know, actually doing the sort of shaping, um, they found there's something like 50 different axes, if memory serves. So, mm. so there's lots and lots of, you know, much more than any functional need. You know, you don't need 50 people around a tree hitting it with an axe. So there seems to be something much more going on. And I wonder actually, in terms of the idea of a human sacrifice as a collective, yeah, as a as a social event, and actually other people taking responsibility for it. So maybe if there is a triple killing, it could. Yeah, I'm sure it is symbolic, but maybe it's also serving other functions. 
I, again, this um, perhaps uh, the, the best way to conclude, if we can conclude, is to invite you back to perhaps if you if you're able to develop this research. I mean, the, the crossovers with anthropology uh, seem to me outstanding as well. Uh, so hopefully you will be doing more uh, on this 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 gr admittedly gruesome topic. And um, I'm hoping, hoping that you will be able to come back and, and develop uh, your ideas with us. So I, I would just like to um, thank you both for an extremely uh, horrifying, <laughs> yeah, intriguing reconstruction of a, of a, a theatre of pain. Um, I suppose perhaps in a more mundane way, I think also for demonstrating so well the, the crossover between, certainly between um, archaeological and some legal techniques, uh, which to me is really about you know th this exciting exciting work a, a splendid demonstration of the um the insights that innovative and cross-disciplinary scholarship can bring so professor chapman dr geary thank you very much indeed thank you for having us mm. absolute pleasure